Uh, thanks everyone for uh, for coming for the presentation to the, my talk today. So um, today I will present some evidence on the multisensory body representation and how this changes following spinal cord injury. So we can start with the simple question, what is multisensory body representation and why is it useful? So how do I know that this is my body? The internal representation of the body develops the integration of multiple sensory inputs, meaning that to know that this is my body, I continuously need to integrate stimuli that are visual, tactile, somatos somatosensory, uh, proprioceptive, even interoceptive, so even visceral inputs. This is a dynamic process because our brain, without that uh, we are aware of it, continuously predicts and updates these multiple sensory inputs. And this is a dynamic process because it can also be modified in short period of time. So for example, during bodily illusions, we are able to reconstruct our body perception. Um, two mechanisms can contribute to the multisensory body representation that we can divide in uh, bottom-up or top-down mechanisms. For bottom-up mechanism, we mean um, those mechanisms that relate to our perception. So the integration of these multiple sensory inputs, so integration of visual, somatosensory, auditory, and so on. For top-down uh, processes, we mean uh, those processes that relate to the persistent knowledge about our body, meaning the semantics and the memories of our body. These two uh, mechanisms are not completely separated because um, they um, co-construct each other. So basically, they interact. It's uh, multisensory integration is fundamental to create our persistent knowledge about our body, so our memory of the body. Uh, why is it useful? Is it useful for uh, perceiving the surrounding environment, and it's also important for motor control. Um, there are many uh, studies that uh, have shown that there, um, in uh, different clinical population, multisensory body representation is impaired. And this um, clinical population include, uh, for example, chronic regional brain syndrome, dystonia, amputation, eating disorders, and schizophrenia. Some of these uh, conditions also develop chronic pain. Um, and there is a, a well-known theory uh, that has been uh, uh, proposed uh, for uh, uh, pain and multisensory body representation basically states that chronic pain develops because there is an incongruence in the sensory motor process. In this simple cartoon here, I show, for example, an example of an action execution. There is a motor command from our cortex. Our brain makes prediction also about what are those sensory feedback that we are going to perceive. When we perform an action, we perceive those sensory feedback. Our brain compares those predicted to the ones that have been perceived. Uh, basically, uh, the comparison between these two optimizes the motor control. This theory states that if uh, at any point of this process, uh, the sen of this uh, sensory motor functioning, uh, this process can be compromised. They may present conflicting information to the nervous system. So basically, anomalous sensation can be warning signals or precursors to pain. It's a very old theory, but uh, it's uh, still well accepted and has been um, um, highly um, um, investigated in the field of chronic pain. So um, there is also uh, evidence that some um, procedures that we can call here like bodily illusion are able to reduce pain. Uh, I will not go into the detail of each bodily illusions, but basically the way that these illusions work um, are... Uh, by manipulating multiple sensory input in a way that uh, we can trick our brain to trick our pain. These illusions include, for example, mirror box illusion that's mainly used for, uh, during, um, uh, for studies uh, with amputees. A rubber end illusion, football illusion, and walking illusion. If you're curious, you can ask me questions about each of these illusions, but uh, um, they all share uh, the manipulation of multiple sensory input. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, what about spinal cord injury? So uh, when I joined the lab, we wanted to try these solutions and um, try um, to optimize these procedures also related to spinal cord injury, how uh, we could, uh, uh, for example, um, improve the chronic pain that follows spinal cord injury. And I assumed that there have been um, many studies that have been looking into multisensory body representation after spinal cord injury, but that was not true. So today I'm going to answer some of these questions. So this uh, created a line of research in our lab. Uh, our sensory signals are integrated after spinal cord injury. Does neuropathy in pain affect multisensory integration? How does body representation change after spinal cord injury? And does neuropathy in pain affect body representation? 
so these are the studies that I will focus on my presentation today. I will start with some studies on multisensory integration. So as I said before, these are more related to uh, bottom-up perception um, uh, uh, mechanism of the brain. And then I will move to the topic of body representation. And finally, I will, I will introduce uh, a new study that we're going to perform uh, that uh, uh, is going to manipulate um, uh, a body representation using body illusion and uh, um, trans transcranial direct current stimulation. So let's start with the topic of multisensory integration. What is multisensory integration? It is uh, the process by which we integrate stimuli from multiple sensory inputs, and this generates a facilitatory effect on perception and action. So these, these effects are called superadditive, meaning, for example, that uh, my response to a stimulus that is audiovisual is uh, more than the sum and probability of the unimodal stimuli. This is just an example of a firing rate of a neuron, but, uh, but um, uh, this can be any type of response. It can be a behavioral response, like a reaction time, it can be an evoked potential from our brain. Um, and on the right here, instead, we um, uh, find a very simple way that describes uh, where these inputs are integrated. So basically, we perceive these inputs that can be integrated at the sensory level in the so-called sensory-specific multisensory areas. Uh, there is more evidence and more evidence these days that our unisensory cortex are not simply unisensory. So somatosensory, auditory, and visual cortex are able to integrate stimuli that can be bimodal. And then there is a cross um, a model, uh, there is a set of cross model regions uh, that involve, for example, the posterior parietal cortex, the superior temporal sulcus, the, uh, the solata prefrontal cortex, and so on. Uh, here, I also show that this. Um, uh, the way that these uh, brain, that these uh, areas integrate cross modern information can be manipulated by top down mechanisms like attention. So, for example, selective attention is able to change the way we can respond to cross modern stimuli. Um, so, um, recently I proposed the theory for which multisensory integration could be impaired in spinal cord injury. Um, so um, my theory states that um, after spinal cord injury, because of a series of events, um, as an opposite of an effect that's called multisensory integration, we could find effects like depression or competition. And this is because spinal cord injury undergoes motor, proprioceptive, some other sensory impairments that could be reduced experience with cross motor cue. There can be reduction in GABA inhibition for dysfunction and lateral inhibition that is known to affect multisensory integration. And there is a unisensory imbalance. For example, we can think that there are some information that are impact, like, like uh, visual information and data information, they are able to dominate over information that are weak, for example, somatosensory. And finally, they can be reduced the responsiveness to cross modal acuse in multisensory areas, both at the sensory and non-sensory specific level. Here I showed the same um, diagram that I showed before by relation to spinal cord injury. So in this theory, I was uh, thinking that, for example, inputs can be perceived as a weak, like somatosensory uh, information in a complete lesion, or uh, they can be perceived as dominant, like auditory information. There is evidence, for example, of exaggerated startle response in spinal cord injury, or that they process some auditory information that are salient to them faster than a healthy controls, for example, a sound of a wheelchair. So this information is basically unbalanced, and they reach either some, uh, sensory specific and uh, cross modal regions in a different way that uh, uh, can be processed by healthy control subjects. Finally, I uh, did not have any expectation about uh, how top-down modulation could uh, change multisensory integration because there is not enough literature. There is very little, uh, very little literature that shows uh, some deficit in attention and proactive control in spinal cord injury, but we don't know how this could affect the way they integrate the stimuli. Uh, so this theory states basically that because of all of these um, uh, problems, as an opposite of a superadditive effect that I showed before, we could assist an effect that could be subadditive. For example, the response to audiovis to uh, a bimodal stimulus could be less than the sum and probability of unimodal stimulus. Um, or the effect could be uh, could generate a depression, meaning that the response of the bimodal stimulation could be less than the unimodal, or there could be no integration at all. 
the basically the response to unimodal lobby model stimulation could be the same. We tested this uh, in, a, in a set of participants with spinal cord injury and control subject. I use the um, classical detection task. Now there are two ways that you can study multisensory integration. You can study multisensory integration with a stimuli that can be temporally congruent. So multiple sensory stimuli are delivered in a way that they happen at the same time, or they can be delivered in the same space. So I choose the temporally congruent uh, effect. And this is just an example of one single trial. We had the 480 trials. So uh, each trial started with a fixation cross that was followed by uh, one of these stimulus. So each of our participants could attend the stimulus that could be visual or could be auditory or tactile that was delivered above level of injury on the forehead or a combination of them, maybe modal, uh, that could be audio, a tactile, audiovisual, audio tactile, or um, um, visual tactile. Or there could be a catch trial, which is a trial in which no stimulation was delivered. And these are randomly uh, introduced in this type of task just to reduce the expectation of participants. We asked our participants basically to attend each of these stimuli and to respond verbally with a yes as fast as possible. And we recorded vocal reaction time. This was just a behavioral, so we just record the vocal, yeah, we just record the vocal reaction time, yeah, we didn't stimulate anything, no. Uh, what? Oh, yeah, so this is the duration of each stimulus that the participants would see on the screen. So this is an example of an experimental trial. So basically, when we do this uh, task, we mean we uh, need many repetitions. And when repetition, this is an example of, of one of them. So it means that uh, the, for each time started with a fixation cross of a second and a half, the participants were instructed to look at it meaning that they knew that after this, anything would happen. And what happened after a variable interval of uh, 500 milliseconds or a second and a half, um, they would uh, uh, have any of this stimulation. They could perceive a visual stimulus or an auditory or a tactile or a combination of them. And when after they perceived each of them, they had to respond verbally as fast as possible. But? No, no, no stimulation. Not stimulation on the brain. We just record the vocal reaction time. This was just to see if the multisensory integration itself was impaired. By catch trial, catch trial means that there is nothing. It means, for example, that after a fixation cross and this variable interval, there could be uh, a catch trial, just a blank screen that was no stimulation. We randomly introduce a small percentage of those to reduce their expectation. Otherwise, they always expect that after a fixation cross, there is a stimulus. So sometimes you need to reduce their expectation in, by introducing a catch trial. So it, uh, after this, any of these stimulus could, uh, this stimuli could be delivered. Is that clear? <laughs> Are you sure? Yeah, no, th this is it. I mean, it's, yeah, sorry. I don't have a diagram, but yeah. Is it clear to anyone? I can be more specific to anyone else that's confused. So, so I, I find that the whole confusing because I think in your trials, you say you're presenting the visual and or the auditory and or the tactile at the same time. And your timeline suggests that they're not at the same time. So maybe you could clear that up for us. Yes, so um, they could perceive one unimodal stimulation that could be visual, auditory, or, or tactile, one of those three, not the three together. Yeah. Or, like yeah, because, well, yeah. No, it's they're random. No, they're random. So in this type of task, this is just a timeline. Okay, so that would have made a better uh, 
figure, but basically all of these stimuli are random. So usually in psychology or cognitive neuroscience, we cannot follow the or, or we cannot follow orders. So it has to be the expectation of the participants to be reduced a lot. So they are all random. Okay. Yes, that's a bit more stimulation. Yes, at the same time. At the same time, exactly. After after some uh, variable duration, the two stimuli are delivered at the same time, like the green nick and auditory via headphone, or the tactile on the forehead and the, and the visual, or the auditory by headphone and the tactile on the forehead. Okay, yeah. So uh, each of these stimuli can all together all the, at the same time. All right? Okay, go ahead. So the way that uh, reaction times usually uh, um, are represented uh, as a result of this is that usually you have two independent signals, the visual and auditory in this case, that they have their own reaction time. This is a cumulative distribution function. And then uh, you have the bimodal stimulation, in our case of the visual, that's always faster than unimodal. So no matter what, every, everyone shows this. So bimodal stimuli or trimodal stimuli are always faster than the way we process unimodal model okay and this is called redundant signal effect now i hope i'll be clear here that to study multisensory integration this redundant signal effect is not enough okay so uh, what we do is a, a statistical procedure called independent race model basically to prove that there is a multisensory integration effect, uh, we need the so-called violation of the model, meaning that we compare our bimodal stimulation, in this case audiovisual, to a predicted model, the black line that's called race, that is basically based on the sum and unimodal probability of those two unimodal stimulation. So it's basically uh, the um, sum of the unimodal stimulation minus the product of them. So this is this equation just basically shows the race model. We create this statistical property and we compare the bimodal stimulation to that. We have a multisensor integration effect only when the, the, the visual stimulation or the bimodal stimulation is faster than the race. Okay. Um, these are the results of our control subjects. So here we are observing a cumulative distribution function on standardized re reaction times. So the first is a visual tactile condition. Then we have another tactile condition, a visual condition, and another tactile condition. So as you can see, the colored lines that represent our bimodal conditions are faster than the black lines. That is the race model. That is based on the unimodal uh, probabilities. We calculate two uh, parameters in this curve. We calculate the intercept and the slope. And these are the results of spinal cord injury. Uh, so as you can see, there is a, a very little violation of the model at the beginning of the curve or no violations at all. And this is a better way to visualize what I just showed you. So for example, this blue line here is basically the difference between these two. So the difference between the race and the um, B-model stimulation in the visual data condition. So as you can see, all the values above zero are considered enhancement effect. So the super additive effect that I was saying before. And meaning that our control subject uh, with increasing reaction time, they still integrated the stimuli in all conditions. And then we have the red line here represented by the SCI participants. And as you can see, the integration is much more reduced and decreased with increasing reaction time. Uh, all the values below zero are not considered integration effect, they are considered independent processing or competition effect. Um, so basically, our spinal cord injury participants have reduced the sensor integration. They um, in, uh, were able to integrate stimuli up to the 40% of the curve. And with increasing reaction time, this did not stay. So our sensor is... In Yeah, so there were, uh, it was kind of a um, heterogeneous uh, sample. So we have cervical and thoracic complete and incomplete. Yeah, so they are not uh, any specific injury. 
No, but that's a very good question. Yeah, because I did not have enough participants, but um, I believe that's important to have a larger sample size to look exactly as you say. The only um, mainly uh, not much thoracic versus cervical, but complete and complete are very important. I believe so. No, in this uh, sample size, only five people had neuropathy in pain. Only five people in this sample size have neuropathy in pain. So in this, at the at the first, so this is just the first study that I did, and we did not uh, control for neuropathy in pain. No, there were only very few, few people had neuropathy in pain. Okay, so this one. Yeah. I um you're right. I did not show here a um a figure with the standard deviation, but uh, um we calculated the intercept and the slope. So the intercept, the fifty percent of the curve, uh, with the so we get the probability when this is at the fifty percent, and we calculate the difference between the race and uh, and um, and the B modal stimulation. That's that's what we do, and then we compare the intercept values between groups. So we get the intercept from control and the intercept from SCI. We compare those. Yeah, and after that, yes, you do an analysis. So you do the NOVA. Yeah, you calculate the intercept between groups and condition, and then you do an ANOVA. We have a pretty good, even if the sample size was to be 15 versus uh, 17 uh, controls. We have, um, I don't show here, but we, we have published it, and the, uh, the FS size was, was kind of between medium large. Usually, because we have many repetitions, we have 480 trials here. So we don't do this with very little amount of trial. We cannot, we cannot do that. I still, uh, I still have, well, I don't know, but yeah. Okay, so uh, the conclusion of this first study is that multisensory integration was reduced after spinal cord injury, and we have evidence of subadditive effect followed by no integration. Uh, I do not show here, but we have evidence from a computational model. So we tested um, um, where was the difference between uh, control and SCI in this multisensory integration effort. And our hypothesis was, as I said at the beginning, to test for unisensory imbalance and also for silence and competition. So we found that this difference between group uh, were um, um, related to reduce the silence of the stimulus when they were bimodal and uh, followed by the high per a higher percept of competition. And so these um, uh, two deficits of silence and competition in spinal cord injury um, contributed to the multisensory integration effort. So now the question is that how does neuropathy in pain affect this multisensory integration? Because individuals with neuropathy in pain may process cross modal information a different way. So we repeated the same task. I'm sorry, it's the same figure. But, um, so uh, it's exactly the same task in a new sample size. The study is still in progress. Uh, so far, we were able to collect 21 people. They have a spinal cord injury pain, 14, they have spinal cord injury without pain, and 19 controls. In this study, I collect more data because I collected the reaction time to uh, uh, perform the race model. I collect EG data because we are going to look at the event rate, the potential, and expect the perturbations. We perform a pain assessment and the quantitative sensory testing. So... For neuropathy in pain, yeah, to see the difference between control, because we believe that neuropathy participant and neuropathy in pain may process cross modal information in a different way because of somatosensory organization, sensor sensitization, and so on. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. This is still in progress. This is our simple side so far. And these are the measures that uh, I'm collecting. Today, I will focus on two, on two results. I will present again the race mode evaluation and uh, the results on the pain assessment. Because I did not finish to collect the data, I, don't, I didn't look yet at the EG part. Uh, so the way we perform a pain assessment, we um, in this uh, particular study, I uh, have been using the International Spinal Cord Injury Pain Basic Dataset and the Neuropathy Symptom Inventory. So the first helps us to have a history of their pain, when has been developed, if it's um, help us also to uh, discriminate between pains that are not uh, neuropathic. And um, uh, we can classify up to three worst pain. Uh, that can be um, also helpful to um, start uh, to uh, define the level of this pain if it's a level or below level. And these are some of the uh, descriptors that our participants um, uh, feel when we perform this kind of pain assessment. For example, hot burning, tingling, pins and needles, and so on. We test also for allodynia, apalgesia, and hyperalgesia. So for allodynia, we mean, for example, the perception of a stimulus that they perceive as a painful when it's not painful. And apalgesia and hyperalgesia, we mean the decreased perception and increased perception of a painful stimulus. For neuropathic pain syndrome inventory, this is a 12-item uh, questionnaire that gives us an idea of the severity of the pain. And uh, it tested, for example, how bad could be the pain, the burning pain, like from 0 to 10, squeezing pain, pressure pain, electric shock, and so on. So we classify this in some subscales that can relate to spontaneous pain, evoked pain, and parastasia, dysestasia. So these are um, the results related to the first worst pain level. We have two, 12 participants that have below 11 neuropathy in pain and nine participants that have 11 neuropathy in pain. And uh, this is the, um, the score of the pain severity. So we perform neuropathy in pain syndrome inventory um, on, on overall pain. So if they have two pains, three pains, so this is gonna have the score of all of that. Um, and it relates only to the last 24 hours. This is a total score that suggests a moderate uh, pain, and we have a higher percentage of burning pain, parastasia, dysestasia, um, pressing, paroxysmal, and a very small percentage of evoked pain. And these are the results of the race model. They are similar way that uh, um, they are similar to the to the ones that I showed before. So this is called the Miller's inequality, the difference between those two cumulative distribution functions between race and B model. So again, we show that uh, participants, they have, uh, the, um, the uh, control participants, do have integration that persists also with the slower reaction time, while participants with spinal cord injury have reduced integration followed by higher competition. Now we do not. So here I should, uh, um, oh, here I have an information of the standard division. This is actually the standard error mean. Uh, and we show here, for example, this is just another way to look at this result. So I look at the uh, intercept and the slope, and we don't find a difference between groups. It seems that there is a higher um, uh, uh, multisensory integration deficit for participants, they have pain, but it's not significant yet. And we find difference in both parameters in the slope, in the slope and the intercept. We also find correlations with the um, neuropathy in pain uh, um, subscales of the um, um, neuropathy in pain syndrome inventory. So we find correlation, positive correlation between the beta zero score, which is the intercept, in two conditions, the visotactile and adiotactile, in um, three kinds of subscales, the burning, the paroxysmal pain, and the parastasia dissociation. And then, of course, the total NPSI. The only subscales that was not correlated was the evoked pain. We found that higher is the pain that they perceive. Um, it was kind of unexpected for us, but it's better is their integration. So um, even if participants here don't have reduced integration, those ones they have pain seem to they have higher pain seem to have less impairment in the processing of the multisensory stimuli. So uh, the conclusions here are um, participants with SCI and with or without neuropathy in pain should reduce multisensory integration. 
NPS scores correlate positively with the beta scores. The higher is the pain, the less negative is the beta score, meaning that there is a tendency towards a better integration process. And this could be related to many factors, facilitation, decreased inhibition, center sensitization. And we believe that there is some kind of, uh, uh, because we only found this correlation with the, the, the um, conditions that um, have the tactile, the processing of the tactile stimulation, so the audiovisual and the audio-tactile and the visual tactile we believe that this has uh, also to relate to some kind of somatosen abnormal somatosensory processing in those participants that have pain. Now, of course, cortical data needed for conclusive results and I will be um, um, analyzing that once I will finish the study. So now the next question is, uh, how does body representation uh, change after spinal cord injury? So um, I will move to the topic of body representation. As I said before, multisensory body representation can be divided in uh, two mechanisms, some that can be more perceptual, like the ones I just showed, and something that are more related to top-down processing. So that they relate more to the, our uh, persisting knowledge of uh, our body. Um, so this is just a simple diagram that shows that the construct of multisensory body representation is uh, um, uh, complex because we need integration um, from stimuli that come from that side through perception, but also, as I said, from the inside, the proprioceptive, interoceptive, and vestibular inputs are all important to create a construct of body representation. One way to study body representation in laboratory setting is to study either the body image or body schema. I do prefer to study body schema in this kind of population because it's related to a plastic uh, uh, sensory motor representation of the body that is essential for action. One way to do is, for example, to ask participants to do a mental rotation of the body part. So if I ask you to tell me if this is a left or right hand, you need to internally simulate a rotation of your own hand to tell me that this is a right. 10. And this is basically what we have asked our participants. So we perform this laterality judgment task. Um, participants were uh, um, 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 instructed to attend any of these stimuli. This stimuli could be body related, like a hand or foot, or no body related. These stimuli were oriented in two different orientation angles an easy rotation, a 75 degree, or a difficult rotation, 150 degrees. So we ask them to look at the stimulus presented on the screen and to respond verbally as fast as possible if the stimulus that they would observe was a left or right stimulus. We record the vocal reaction time, accuracy, and EEG signal. These are the results of behavioral results. We found that spinal cord injury uh, participants have a slower reaction time, and in particular, in those stimuli that process body information while they were faster for stimuli that were not body related. We also find a tendency of, of having um, a, a reduced percentage of correct response for only for the rotation that was difficult, uh, the 150 degrees. And we look at different components. Here, for example, I showed the parietal component, uh, the sensory low-level visual component, the parietal P100. And we showed that overall participant with SCI have a reduced P100. So the P100 is related to the visual processing of the stimuli. Then we show a central component that goes from, uh, that um, uh, includes the N100, the P200. And the uh, N100 is usually related to object recognition and attention, while the P200 is related to access to the motor representation. And we find that participants with SCI have reduced N100 and the higher amplitude of the P200. These two components are uh, usually, because are fast components within 200 milliseconds, so they're usually um, less cognitive, as uh, if we want to put this way. And then we go to look at the rotation-related negativity. This is a more cognitive component, and it happens usually around 300, 600 milliseconds after the stimulus. Um, so what we are observing here is the two type of rotation uh, in each of the stimuli between the two groups. The rotation related negativity re, um, um, is basically a, um, a component that relates to mental rotation and discrimination of corporeal versus non corporeal stimuli. The more negative is this component, uh, the more difficult is the task. 
So we find that this modulation between um, the corporeal versus non-corporeal stimuli and between the two rotations, the difficult rotation and the easy rotation, was only uh, present for the control uh, for the control uh, um, uh, participants. With uh, participants that have SCI, have no modulation of the rotation-related negativity. They tend that there is a tendency to have reduced uh, amplitude. So for them, the task was perceived um, higher uh, with the higher difficulty. But there is no discrimination between the two rotation and the three kind of stimuli. Basically, no discrimination between the um, uh, um, stimuli that were not body related versus body related. So what we can conclude from this study, how does body representation change following spinal cord injury? We found evidence of a reduced P100, basically hyperactivity in early visual uh, processing of the stimulus. We found evidence also reduced uh, of a reduced amplitude of the N100 that's related to attention, and that has been uh, linked to inhibitory deficit GABA mediated. Then we find a higher P200, uh, with the um, meaning that there is an, an uh, easier access to the motor representation of salience. So basically, participants with SCI could perceive those uh, um, stimuli body related with more salient compared with, with control subjects. And finally, we find an absence of the rotation related negativity for complex mental rotation. Participants that have SCI showed the same high effort for both ease and difficult rotation of body parts. Overall, they show an abnormal uh, processing of the body representation. So now the next question is, does neuropathic uh, pain affect body representation? Um, and here I'm just going to introduce briefly the study that we will uh, perform this year. We have been recently awarded by a new uh, grant that will allow us to test um, body representation uh, in spinal cord injury with pain and without pain. And we will uh, be able to use uh, a combination of body dilution uh, with the transcranial direct current stimulation to reduce neuropathy in pain. Uh, I'm just going to go very uh, over uh, quickly um, to our aims. So uh, the aim of this study is to investigate the cortical body representation measure in individuals with SCI that have neuropathy in pain, no pain, and fit with control and uh, um, um, control subjects. Uh, so basically, the study that I just performed on the body schema. Uh, and then uh, for M2, we will explore the relationship between neuropathy pain, sensory function, a cortical measure of body representation after a series of transcranial direct current stimulation that we will derive it over the posterior parietal cortex. We will use a uh, anodal stimulation, which is a, um, 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 a positive stimulation. So it's going to depolarize neurons so to uh, stimulate the cortex. And we will pair the transcranial direct current stimulation uh, with with the body illusions, we will use two kinds of illusions, the rubber end illusions and working illusion. And finally, we will explore also qualitatively uh, the effect of uh, this series of stimulation using TDCS and body illusions on participants that have neuropathy pain. Um, here, I'm just going to show a few uh, um, um, future directions on, uh, um, on, like, on what future studies should focus on. So I believe that there is a benefit of multisensory integration training. For example, we could create trainings that would involve the embodiment of artificial device, long-term training sessions that are able to provide continuously multisensory stimulation and they're able to modulate body representation. Uh, this training could be uh, useful to develop rehabilitation strategy in order to normalize the multisensory experience. As we have seen, there is abnormal multisensory integration in spinal cord injury. This could prevent extern uh, extensive cortical organization that in turn can affect the representation of the body and reduce the intensification of neuropathy in pain. And finally, as uh, Roberta was pointing out, it's important to have a selective population. So these kind of studies, we need a very large sample size to control for level of injury completeness at time post-injury. Thank you. Any question? Yeah. Or that is a neuropathic pain that is caused by the, or that is in, enhanced or 
driven by the alteration in the body representation? The first, because I believe that because of neuropathy and pain, there will be more um, a deficit in the way they process their uh, body representation. Yeah. So here, because we did not have enough uh, participants to look at pain or no pain, but for example, this component here is then 200. And we found that those participants, they have neuropathy and pain of a larger N200. N200 is related to the processing of your body. And uh, usually the larger is the amplitude and more abnormal is the way you perceive your body. And this has been linked to eating disorder, like anorexia and so on. And we also find that, I don't, I don't know show here, but we found higher desynchronization in those individuals that have neuropathy and pain or the process, during the processing of body stimuli. Could be, yes. There is evidence on phantom pain and amputees, like these uh, components. Uh, the way we find it, it goes uh, sim in a similar way, um, um, like um, in the amputees uh, population. Mm -hmm. There could be chronic regional pain syndrome as well, mm -hmm. uh, phantom pain in amputees. Um, yeah. I think as a con because of the sub subcortical um, um, because of it's a spinal cord injury because of the cortical alteration this then leads to reorganization cortical processing of this stimuli Um, here we mainly go look like uh, I have cognitive aspects, so later uh, uh, processing of the stimuli. What? Oh, the so we look at parietal and central. So basically, central parietal could be um, like in this case, C three, C four is the motor cortex. We look at CZ or FCZ, and we look at the parietal, posterior parietal. So it's related to the visual processing, to the recognition of the stimulus, and to the um, uh, cognition or like related to the way we uh, think our body is perceived. So as I said before, uh, like memories, things that come from our memory, like I have a good memory of my body. Like I know if I have to walk into a very narrow space, I know how large is my body, right? If I fit or I don't fit. So to do this kind of processing, I need to recall from my memory memory, uh, the knowledge about my body. So we look mainly cognitive components, later components. It could be that as a consequence of um, subcortical changes, then this goes to affect the cortical processing of the body representation. Oh, yeah, this is all supraspinal, yes. This, even if the stimulation we're going to use, we're going we're gonna to target the posterior parietal cortex that is uh, um, um, defined as an associative cortex. The response, for example, to be model or trimodal stimulation. So all we do is uh, supraspinal. Because we are interested mainly to um, sensory, right? To reduce pain, to understand how participants have pain process their body. And if we manipulate their body representation, how this is going to reduce their pain. Medication, yeah, they are. Uh, it depends. It, it depends. They can. They are, um, I have been. Uh, I also had one participant that was a morphine once. So it really depends. It's um, this population that take medication for pain or for spasms or um, any kind of medication. So we have records of medication. Um, I don't check uh, for differences because there is um, each of them are so unique and the doses are so different. So I cannot classify. I don't have enough power with the sample size to classify what kind of medication and the dose, how this affect this. But in theory, if you have a very large sample size, you could do, go and classify what kind of medication and the dose that they take if there is any relation with the way we look at our measures. Thank you.